everyone, and thank you for joining us today um, at the second event organized by the Space Arbitration Association this year. It is also the second event of a new event series we're organizing with the aim of putting the focus on the development of space activities around the world. Today we will focus on Asia and we have the privilege of having three excellent speakers here who will be able to provide insights into the current regional developments. Before I introduce them, again, thank you to Torsten and Elena and Space Watch Global and do become a space watcher. And with this, um, we return to today's topic, the space industry in Asia. Our three speakers today are Peng Wang, professor at Xiang Jiatong University in China, Charles Tay, attorney at Mayor Brown in Singapore, and Chinmoy Roy, who is head of legal at Antrix in India. I will introduce each of them quickly, and then we will dive into the discussion. So Dr. Peng Wong is an associate professor of international law and Tang scholar at Xiang Jiatong University School of Law in China. He got his PhD degree from the same university and was once a Silk Roads visiting scholar at Cambridge University Lauterbach Center for International Law in the UK and an intern at the Energy Charter Secretariat in Brussels. His re current research interests cover international investment law, international law, and international relations, and with most interesting, interestingly for today, China's space law and policy, theories of international law, and China's energy law and policy. He has published articles in leading academic journals, including the Exit Review, the World Journal of Energy Law and Business, and many others. And amongst his longer publications, he has, he has authored two monographs in Chinese, and co-authored the report on compatibility of Chinese laws and regulations with the provisions of the Energy Charter Treaty. Thank you for joining us today. Charles Tay is a senior associate at Mayer Brown's International Arbitration Practice in Singapore. He has about eight years of experience with commercial dispute resolution, including in high technology related international disputes, including on modern clean energy, and artificial intelligence. He recently published a research article on satellite launch and production services and arbitration in the Chinese private sector after spending five years studying and working in Beijing. He's a Peking University LLM alumni, and he shares that while he's a lawyer now back in high school, close to two decades ago, his nickname was Rocket Scientist. And Chin Mai Roy, our last speaker is currently serving as the head of the legal functions at Antrix Corporation, the commercial arm of the Indian Space Research Organization. Chinmoy's responsibilities encompass various aspects of space law, seamlessly bridging the gap between theory and practice. Beyond his professional endeavors, he actively engages in academic research, delving into the intricacies of space law and exploring its, its evolving landscape. His research findings have garnered recognition, and he has been honored with the opportunity to present them at the International at the Astronautical Congress. International Astronautical Congress. He is also a member of an international working group of the International Institute of Space Law, which is making policy recommendations to address light pollution and other astronomical hindrances arising from satellite deployments. Furthermore, he is also an expert in international arbitration and at present actively involved in handling transnational litigation in more than eight countries pertaining to a significant multi-billion dollar arbitration award emanating from the biggest dispute ever witnessed by the space industry. So thank you all three for joining us today. And with that, we will go directly to the discussion. So like last time, I would like to start the event off with a more personal question and would like to ask each of you to tell us a little bit about their work and involvement with outer space. How did you become interested in, in outer space and how are you currently dealing with it in your work? So maybe we can start with Peng. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Laura, for the introduction. I'm very much glad to be here. Uh, by the way, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on which time zone you are in. Uh, uh, thanks also goes to the uh, Space Watch Global, uh, Alina uh, and uh, Torsten, I'm sorry uh, if I uh, missed pronunciation. Uh, my uh, interest in, uh, in space, uh, in space law is mainly uh, a purely actually academic because 
from the introduction uh, that uh, uh, you can see my background is mainly uh, academic. Uh, so my research interest in investment law. So I, I noticed that uh, there are certain collision between investment law region and the space law region, right? So uh, I really interested in see how the rules uh, for space uh, rules and policies perhaps uh, involve uh, with emerging uh, what we still call uh, commercialization of space, right? In increasing involvement of private investor in this space sector. So that actually uh, is the sole concern of uh, uh, sole interest uh, why I uh, work uh, on China's law or space law and policy to say, okay, what China located in the grand picture and how the technical and the legal aspect may evolve over time. So really glad to be here. All right. Thank you. That is very similar to the reasons why I have become interested in space. Um, Tim Noy? Tim Noy, sorry. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, Laura and uh, the other organizers for organizing this wonderful event. Uh, so my involvement in space starts in 2018 uh, when I joined Antrix Corporation. Uh, and since then, like I have been working full time uh, in this uh, organization, which is a 100% government of India owned uh, organization and uh, working actively in the space industry. So I've been handling litigation and uh, drafting uh, legal contracts related to uh, utilization of space and then uh, mutual collaboration, uh, uh, also evaluating and analyzing the export control laws and to uh, how to enable business uh, uh, between uh, players, multinational players across borders. And uh, uh, so um, uh, going a bit, uh, into the history uh, since school uh, itself I was very interested in space and uh, uh, one of the most inspiring moments was reading the biography of uh, Kalpana Chawla who was one of the astronauts uh, uh, who was snatched away from us uh, in the 2003 Columbia disaster, uh, Columbia space shuttle disaster. So she was in fact the first uh, astronaut a uh, female astronaut of Indian origin. And uh, since then, like, I was very fascinated about space. And then I, uh, after law school, I was practicing law uh, before various courts in India, including the Supreme Court of India and the high courts. And then this opportunity came in for Antrix. And then I was, uh, like, so thrilled to apply for it. And after a nationwide uh, recruitment exercise, I was selected and since then I have been continuing into this. So this is uh, my background in space. It's like a dream dream job for a lawyer interested in space. Oh, yes. Um, Charles? Hi, so it's a pleasure to be here and uh, it's, it's a pleasure to uh, listen to everybody and all these uh, great stories about how everybody can, has come to be involved in space. Uh, as for myself, uh, as introduced earlier on, I'm an inter international arbitration lawyer and I work uh, mainly in high value disputes across uh, the world. And, and that straddles many sectors, uh, not just space, but uh, it, it, it covers industries such as energy, it covers manufacturing, it covers science and technology. Uh, as, as for how I came to be involved in space, uh, that has come by uh, through a mixture of a uh, chance uh, friendship and interest and and that's because uh several years ago in the course of my practice i uh, uh you would have heard earlier on that that when i was in school uh, two decades ago i was uh my, my nickname was rocket scientist and there's a bunch of reasons for that but in 2017 i was uh, traveling and i met uh, some people in the space industry and uh that has uh and and i and 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 those interactions were were extremely fascinating to me. I, I had very long discussions with them, and 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 so even as I continued with my work as an arbitration lawyer in international disputes, I saw that there was this uh, intersection between uh, space, uh, the the space industry, and my work as a as a disputes lawyer, and as uh, Chin Moi uh, is very very closely aware of in in the course of his work. You know, like uh, when we talk about space, when we talk about 
uh, new technology, when we talk about launchers, when we talk about satellites, there's quite a lot of, uh, there's quite a high probability that things can go wrong and there's uh, quite a lot of risk that has to be managed in the process of developing, the process of research and the process of contracting. And so uh, that, led, that led to me uh, over the past four or five years or so, uh, to pursue this uh, personal interest in developing, uh, in, in, in finding out more about space and in uh, getting to know the industry. And that has com culminated in this paper, which I did, uh, which was published in a Journal of International Arbitration last year called um, the uh, Satellite Launch and Production Services and Arbitration in the Chinese Private Sector. And this has come up from my past uh, several years of living and working in China, uh, where I was with uh, Zhongdun Law Firm, one of the Red Circle law firms in China, working in the dispute resolution and arbitration team. So that's in short from me. Thank you. A very interesting article, highly recommended. So with this, maybe we, we go into the more substantive part of the webinar and start discussing the current state of the space industry in Asia. And I would like to ask Peng first, um, if he can give us an overview of what is happening in China. We hear a lot, but I don't think, um, I would say, um, at least in in Europe and the in, in the US, we are more aware of SpaceX than, may, than maybe similar companies in China, but they do exist. So if you could tell us a little bit more about those efforts. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Laura. It's a challenging job, right? Give a short overview of so many activities going on right now. So for starters, uh, if you follow the field uh, closely, uh, this morning, Beijing time, uh, roughly at 9.30, the uh, Shenzhou 16 manned flight have been successfully launched with three astronauts. Uh, one of them actually is from academia. He's a professor of uh, Beihang University, right? Roughly at my age. So I did feel the pressure on my shoulder, right? So, uh, and the commander of the flight actually is a alumni of my uh, university, right? Xi'an Jiaotong University. Uh, that being said, uh, that uh, actually today's launch marked the 29th uh, launch of the uh, manned flights. Uh, and the, let's get me the number right, the 475th uh, launch of the Long March rocket system. So uh, it, it's quite, uh, quite uh, actually uh, a progressive there, right? So uh, I will briefly in the following uh, minutes uh, summarize China's activity in space industry uh, into three, uh, three categories. First is the space uh, technology and the system. Second is on space application uh, in many commercial and uh, public service contests. The last one will be space science. First on space technology and system, uh, first it would be the uh, transportation system, right? We know the Long March rocket system and also many other private commercial uh, vehicles now and uh, fast development. We do not yet have the star company like SpaceX, but uh, they're emerging, emerging uh, launching service uh, companies like uh, Smart Dragon, uh, Quangzhou, and uh, Hyperbola, right? So, uh, and uh, they also test uh, sea-based uh, launch uh, service in recent uh, in recent years. And uh, the uh, second on the space infrastructure. Now, we you probably know that. China have a, a traditionally have a three launch uh, base in uh, in Jiuquan. Uh, uh, sorry, let me get the number right. Uh, now we have a fourth coming in in, uh, in Hainan, right? Space launch, right? Uh, first, uh, relatively old, outdated one would be Jiuquan, uh, Taiyuan, and uh, Xichang launching service, really high altitude. Now we have a low altitude launching site in Hainan called Wenchang. Now it's uh, not yet come into operation, but uh, very close. Um, and uh, we uh, per perhaps you have know the uh, navigation system called Beidou, Beidou satellite navigation system, quite uh, uh, famous and now uh, instead of full constellation of 30 satellites and uh, arise into full capacity for operation. Um, we also have OK, okay manned flights, right? Manned space flight and the China space uh, station, right? 
which is under operation for years and uh, continue to be uh, with a uh, task of many uh, tasks and welcome for international cooperation application uh, for cooperation for uh, experiments, right? So uh, next on um, space technology would be uh, uh, the experiment uh, on new technologies, like uh, perhaps you would be interested in uh, space debris, cleaning smart self-management uh, space uh, craft, right? So it's like automatic man, uh, man uh, automatically driven uh, spacecraft, right? So this is on this technology side. On the application side, traditionally would be focusing more on the public service, like emergency management, um, emergency community, monitoring of disaster, early warning, that kind of creation in public interest. Nowadays, we see more commercial driven or commercial settings uh, in the application of satellite related service, mainly uh, the Beidou system and other uh, high resolution telecommunication and other service uh, in the area. Uh, so that would be a space application and a space science. Actually, I'm not in position to say this because I have purely a legal research background. I I didn't know what that mean like research on on uh, space gravitational wave detection, right? Space based solar observatory, right? I have no idea what that means. <laughs> right? Just showing you, uh, share with you the information I get. Uh, and also a lot of uh, experiments, right? Experiments mainly uh, on uh, actually, uh, this is kind of uh, forward looking preparation for further exploration, like on Mars, on moons. So this, a lot of uh, very fundamental basic uh, uh, scientific experiments uh, taking place. Okay, I probably stop here, Laura, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and I will continue with, with Charles because I think he's also quite um, well informed of what is happening in China. So maybe follow up on, on what Peng said. And if you can tell us a little bit about the um, distribution between private and public investment in outer space, would you say it's all government um, driven or are there also private investors who are involved in space? Thanks very much. I would say it's a it's a mix, and it has been changing over over the course of time. In in, in the early years uh, of uh, Chinese uh, space uh, sector, uh, at the time of the Zhuquan, uh, you know, like satellite launch center and, and, and launch center, and you would see that up on the screen over here is uh, was is it's a painting of uh, Zhuquan's. Uh, uh, 30th anniversary, and that was in 1988, uh, it, because it was set up in, in 1958, and that's a long, long time ago, uh, I think before many of us here on this panel are born. And uh, so China Satellite, China Space Program started a long time ago, and at that time, uh, it, it worked with, uh, it was it was government-led, and it was government-led, it was, uh, there, there were cooperations with uh, other countries, with the Russians, and and but in the course of the past uh five to seven years or so uh this has been changing and it has been changing because of a shift in the in, in chinese uh, government policy to allow uh the private sector to uh, enter into the space sector uh with a belief that with the benefit of private investment and private investments direction uh there can be greater progress and greater speed in in and greater dynam dynamism in 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 how uh, the space industry develops and so uh in the course of the past several years uh the chinese space industry has gotten a lot of investments uh in the private sector it has gotten easily more than a billion uh, usd worth of of investments and this would have come from uh, mostly, you know, like uh, Chinese investments and sometimes even uh, investors that may be linked to uh, uh, international investment companies around the world. And and you would see that some, some years ago, there, there were some uh, very large headline uh, news whereby Chinese uh, startups in the space industry uh, have gotten large amounts of funding. For example, in 2020, uh, there was a, a launch company called iSpace, which got uh, 173 million USD in funding. They have uh, 
And there's also another launch company called uh, Landspace, which has, which got uh, 175 million USD in funding. And these were in uh, the course of their uh, development. In the, the, these companies will go through the usual uh, rounds of funding, Series A, Series B, Series C, Series C plus D potentially, and uh, some of them have uh, goals of I of having an IPO in the future and going public. And uh, many of these companies are, are, are big and they are well resourced and they uh, are trying to uh, catch up, I, I suppose uh, would be the right word to use uh, with SpaceX, which started much earlier. And and uh, the two companies that I mentioned earlier on are about launch, but there is also there are also companies that focus on satellite manufacturing, and uh, those have also gotten very large investments in the past several years. Uh, there was a pre-IPO round of investment by uh, for Changguang Satellite, and that got USD about three hundred seventy-five million, if I'm not wrong, and that's a very substantial sum. That's uh, that gives these companies a lot of resources. To uh to 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 engage in manufacturing, to engage in manufacturing well, to engage in research and development, to to engage in uh, developing their technologies, solid fuel rockets, liquid fuel rockets, etc. So it's very very fascinating, and uh if and and this is just talking about the uh private sector in 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 China, and. But it's not just China because space is something that's global, and and you will also see that uh, uh, there are Chinese companies as well who go out beyond China, go beyond the shores of China, and invest in in uh, space activities in other countries. And and some years ago, for example, I will give an example. Tencent, a uh, famous Chinese company, uh, was was uh, participated in the Series B investment rounds for Satellogic of uh, in Argentina. And 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 so pumped uh, quite a number of million dollars in into that, and uh, I may be understating the amount. And you would also and in I think a couple of years ago, the Chinese government also relaxed uh, its rules in its investment catalog, such as to allow uh, foreign participation in in uh, in in industries in China that that relate to the manufacturing of civil satellites, the manufacturing of satellite payloads, satellite parts and components, and a few other sectors as well. Uh, so this is something which uh, you we could potentially expect to see further developments on in, in the future. So uh, that's what I have to say for, for this. Very interesting, thank you. And Peng, maybe before we move to India, I don't know if you could say just a few words about the Chinese Moon Programme because I understand that there's a parallel initiative to also um, bring humans back to the moon and maybe cons uh, build permanent bases there. But uh, yes, I guess there there's a plan on man uh, landing on moon uh, because China have done a certain probe test in the far side of the moon. So the uh, return with uh, samples, I, I guess in the long run, they did have actually two uh, giant uh, projects, one is on Moon, one is on Mars. So that is kind of the uh, projects spearheaded, uh, actually uh, overriding uh, in China's grand design of the uh, uh, man fly uh, plan or space industry in to uh, generally speaking. So uh, I guess uh, I, 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 I don't know any uh, concrete timetable for that, but definitely that's the plan because we have in China's White, recent white paper in 2021 on China's space policy, they did mention that, right? They have also conducting experimenting uh, experiments uh, on, risk, on relevant technologies. So we can see a clear, um, clear plan there. Yeah, that's probably what can I say for now, Laura. Thank you very much. So now let's move to India. Chen Moi, could you give us an overview of what India, India is doing and what, what the plans are. India already is a major space-bearing power as well. So I, I assume them, there might be many plans as well in India. Sure, thank you, Laura. Uh, so as many of us uh, would be knowing that uh, the Indian space sector has a very remarkable history. Uh, and India started very early on 
uh, in the 1960s, just uh, in its second decade of independence. And uh, since then, uh, owing to the great vision, caliber, and commitment uh, of our leaders, uh, I think India has been a great achiever in the uh, space sector uh, so far. And uh, over these years, we have seen that there has been a successful Mars mission, a lunar mission, and also we have seen that India uh, has advanced remote sensing capabilities and uh, it has its own navigation system. And uh, we have also achieved uh, geostationary launch capabilities. Uh, which are like more than 10,000 kilometers away from Earth. Uh, and these are like some of the milestones which we have achieved out of a relatively very minuscule budget. And uh, since 2020, uh, and in fact, there was also a push before that, uh, but since, uh, the, since uh, 2020, there has been uh, a revigored push for development of a private space ecosystem in India. And the Indian space regulatory body in space was established in 2020. And uh, since then it has been held hand holding space startups and then uh, taking great initiatives for uh, promoting uh, development of a supply chain around space in India so that like India can be self-reliant and uh, not dependent on overseas uh, components, supply components. And uh, today we see that India is home to a number of growing startups and they are, uh, they are engaged in uh, remarkable innovations. Like we have a company called Skyroot, uh, which is uh, like, uh, which is uh, into development of uh, space launch vehicles and it has already uh, tested its uh, rockets uh, and uh, it is very close to uh, being certified for space worthiness and then it can go ahead and start its launches. We also have other startups who are uh, engaged into uh, formation and then uh, laying down a network of satellites in the low earth orbit and uh, they can be uh, they, there are uh, various uses that they are projecting some of the uses are like communication which already one web and starlink are into there are other uses of uh, remote sensing and like they can map the earth with very high resolution and uh, uh, with great utility both for defense and commercial purposes uh, they can map any point of earth probably every one hour so that's a great uh, capability that uh, they are in the way of uh, developing. And uh, we see that uh, all that the Indian space policy has also been recently launched. And uh, uh, the space policy, as I see it personally, it's a, a great initiative and uh, uh, it has laid out various initiatives, various incentives for the private sector. And uh, it is also, uh, bringing in recognition uh, for innovation and uh, they are bringing in a landscape to uh, promote the private ecosystem in a very big manner. Uh, recently, India has been uh, also one of the countries which has recognized ownership rights in uh, extractions that are done in space, like for space mining, lunar resources and all. So that like uh, the private sector is also incentivized and at the same time, the Indian space policy also lays a roadmap of uh, responsible space behavior, uh, wherein like there have been uh, some obligations that have been put in uh, to all space actors that they have to act in a very responsible way uh, and they have to ensure that there is no debris uh, that is uh, uh, created there and uh, they have uh, capabilities to come back to the Earth's atmosphere after their life cycle and, and various other safeguards like that. And uh, with that, what I see is that uh, India is uh, very much in its path to uh, achieve its goal of uh, uh, having more than 10% share in the global space economy by 2030. So uh, that is like in, on the commercial side of it and uh, on the uh, research side, uh, the Indian Space Research Organization is engaged in a lot of exciting projects and uh, they are going to launch the uh, Chandrayaan 2 mission, Chand sorry, Chandrayaan 3 mission in the next coming one or two months. Uh, also, we have a very ambitious program of launching a, a rover to the uh, sun 
so as to map its surface and uh, also to find out the components of uh, what what is the uh, what is sun composed of and how are those nuclear reactions and all ongoing on the uh, uh, sun surface along with that uh, there are india has also uh, demonstrated uh, demonstrated that uh, india can uh, achieve a reusable launch vehicle uh, recently there was a technological demonstration which was successful along with that a new rocket has been developed which is like on a completely different technology compared to the earlier PSLV and the GSLV launch vehicles of India. And uh, this is like uh, more aimed towards uh, creating the capability uh, of launching smaller satellites in the low Earth orbit so as to save the costs both of the uh, satellites and also to ensure that we have a quick turnaround time and then like, like we can launch a, a rocket every day if uh, that is the need. So uh, that sort of capability has also been successfully demonstrated. So we see that uh, India is in a, uh, India is a very exciting hotbed uh, for innovation and uh, developments in space. So let's see uh, what holds in future for us. Yes, that's very exciting. Just one, one last question on that topic. Um, you, you mentioned that India has authorized um, property rights over um, space resources. I think it was very recently. Could you maybe also say a word about India's relationship or position on the Artemis program? Okay, so uh, as of now, uh, to the best of my knowledge, India is uh, not a signatory of the Artemis Accord. Uh, and like I'm not uh, official spokesperson on that, but what I'll say from my personal uh, my personal thoughts is that India has always tried to be non-aligned and uh, uh, not to like promote formation of groups uh, for uh, like uh, for any space initiatives. Uh, we think that uh, research has to be independent, and uh, then uh, when there are multiple players, then a lot of other uh, developments will come forward with it. So uh, with that perspective, I think that India is not a member of the Artemis Accord, but still uh, India is trying to incentivize the private sector because uh, innovation cannot be a charity. Uh, there has to be there has to be some incentives that has to go on to the private sector. Otherwise, since uh, like Laura, you very well said in the start of this uh, webinar uh, that uh, there there are a lot of failures in space, and uh, we in the industry, domestic industry, we do do talk that space is a very cruel business because the success rates are really low that is. Uh, and as Charles was also speaking about it. So uh, therefore we need to bring uh, on certain incentives uh, so that like we, innovation is promoted. So I think here the aim is not about uh, granting rights for, a, for exploitation or extraction or ownership of uh, minerals that are extracted. It is more inclined towards uh, a promotion of innovation so that people can think of that. Yeah, understood. Thank you very much. Um, so now maybe an open question to all of you. I don't know who would like to reply, but I think we should also mention that there are also other countries in Asia than, than India and China. So maybe, I don't know if you could mention a few other initiatives that you have observed that are ongoing in Asia and maybe other countries. Happy to jump in. I mean, like, uh, I'm a Singaporean lawyer, so I would have to say something about my own country. And uh, and Singapore is a small country, as we all know, uh, but it's also very interested in space. And, uh, you know, like, uh, we do not have uh, large uh, uh, space sectors like uh, China and India do, but but we we do work very closely with uh, with 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 companies around the world in the sector, and we also have companies here which uh, do that. And and in NUS as well in the National University of Singapore, I think I saw the news that a few weeks ago, uh, a satellite was launched uh, using an Indian rocket so successfully to space, and uh, but going beyond Singapore as well, if you talk about big countries and uh, ma major players you, would, you, you, um, you mention would have to be made of Japan and Japan is also a space uh, is uh, is likely uh, a country that, that has very advanced technology and I, and I 
it was it last year or two years ago they also passed the law on uh on on space resources and space business activities and that's something which uh would uh be of interest as well and i think there is also a burgeoning space industry over there and uh there are some space startups such as space bd and a few others that uh, are also involved in the launch of satellites uh and was in the news this morning uh they there was a report of of uh japan wanting to uh, do r d and development into into the use of potential orbital uh, solar power plants you know, where, where you can launch a, a plant into space where you can which will be used to collect other uh, sun's energies and then such energies will be beamed down to earth uh using microwaves uh, to power cities or other things so that's also very fascinating uh from from northeast asia if i can add yes uh, we have in, in asia pacific area we have a organization called asia pacific space cooperation organization which was specifically mentioned by china is uh, a white paper on china's space program uh, that would be a co uh, potential priority uh, uh, cooperation partners uh, that organization uh, focusing on Asia, they have uh, member states of uh, China, Bangladesh, Iran, Mongolia, Pakistan, Peru, Thailand, uh, and have two signatories, uh, uh, Indonesia and uh, Turkey, with I, if I'm correct, with uh, Philippines as of the uh, parties. So the main activities of the EPSCO is actually uh, mainly on satellite based uh, application service. Uh, and uh, uh, capacity building, I guess, right? Uh, there's, a, relating to our legal profession, there's a space law uh, research alliance initiative uh, actually proposed last year. They have several rounds of negotiation on the establishment of such alliance, uh, which will come into play in next year, uh, probably. Okay, that's all I want to add, Laura. Thank you very much. So now we move into my favorite topic, which is arbitration. And we have Chin Moi here with us, who is who is one of the few people I think who has real ex extensive experience in investment arbitration in the space sector with the Davis versus India saga. So mm -hmm. I know um, it's sensitive to talk about cases you have been involved with. But maybe you can give us an overview over what you can say and maybe also Antrix policy on arbitration in general and whether you think this is changing or if, if, for example, private companies in India in the space sector also adopt arbitration clauses in their contracts or if you think that there's um, a trend away from arbitration in India following these cases. Thank you. Okay. Th thank you, Laura. So, uh... What I'll try to speak about is the Antrix versus Devas arbitration award. That is a different award from the investment treaty awards. So this award has recently been set aside uh, by the competent court and this uh, set aside decision has again been upheld. So I think it is uh, safe to speak about it. And also I'll speak things which are already in public domain for all of us to further research on it. Uh, so there was a satellite contract that Antrix had entered into with uh, another Indian company uh, called Devas. Uh, it was having shareholding uh, from uh, some companies in Mauritius and also a, a renowned telecom company from Germany. And uh, these Mauritian companies in turn were having 100% uh, sh shareholdings of American investors. So like uh, most of the shareholders were uh, Americans and uh, they just had a, a like indirect uh, corporate structure wherein they involved Mauritius and uh, then that um, those Mauritian entities in turn uh, they invested in the Indian company Devas. So uh, as per that agreement Antrix was supposed to uh, manufacture a satellite for Devas and Devas was supposed to use it uh, for uh, carrying out, for like delivering multimedia services. And uh, like, I think it is not yet, uh, the world has not yet witnessed 
uh, that technology in use. So what was the basic structure is this, that uh, there would be satellites and they would not be low earth orbit satellites. Those would be geostationary satellites, which are the farthest from the Earth's uh, surface. And uh, that satellite would be placed there. And then there would be uh, mobile phones uh, here in Earth uh, amongst us uh, users. And then they would directly connect with the satellite and then they would offer multimedia services along with telephony. So something like, which is unheard of yet. So that is what was promised. And uh, then there was uh, also uh, an assurance in the agreement that they have the necessary IPRs and all of that uh, in order to uh, effectively carry out whatever uh, they had promised. They are part of the deal. Uh, but then uh, when we uh, things were lost in the fine prints and uh, later on in that ag agreement in uh, an exit, uh, what it was said is that uh, the IPR that we spoke about, uh, those are not only those uh, not only consist of recognized uh, intellectual property rights, but they also consist of know hows and uh, other stuff which is like not yet recognized. So like if I have an idea in the mindset, uh, in my mind, then that is also covered in the definition of the IPR that they had used in that uh, agreement. So like it was uh, something that uh, like I joined much uh, later, but like it was something very bizarre to me, uh, considering like almost seven, eight years of my experience. Uh, so that was like one of the things. The second thing, what they promised that their capabilities that is like not yet in vogue in, in the uh, whole world. It is not yet known. And uh, then what happened is that later on, uh, it was found that uh, the satellite uh, deal may not uh, have been uh, awarded after due process. So there was no tender and uh, there was no public uh, consultation or there was uh, no public involvement. And then this uh, deal was granted. So. Uh, after that, so Indian government then it decided, and, and it was also one of the main causes was uh, that, uh, as most of us would be knowing here, that uh, every company, every country, sorry, is uh, given rights to use a particular sp space spectrum, and it is a limited resource. We cannot exceed that and use some other country's resource. So this, this was part of the S-band spectrum. And as per this contract, along with the satellites, they were getting uh, like practically usage rights uh, for lifetime. Uh, even after the satellite would have uh, ended its life, uh, they would have they could replace it with another satellite and then you again use this spectrum and uh, as per this contract almost 70% of the S-band spectrum of India would be granted to Devas. So that was something uh, that uh, also again uh, sorry I'll again give a background uh, S band is a spectrum which has the minimum uh, aberrations or like minimum dispersions and uh, they, they can like uh, transmit in any weather. And these are very crucial for the use of uh, defense forces where we need uninterrupted uh, communication. So 70% of that was supposed to go to Devas. Uh, again, that was also one of the reasons that this agreement was uh, cancelled. After this agreement was cancelled, uh, we uh, also uh, extended an offer to refund the uh, security deposit, uh, which was lying with us. And again, one more fact is relevant here. Uh, this satellite was not to be built uh, in uh, out of the funds that Devas would have given us. Like Devas would be giving us in phase wise. Uh, which would be spread across say 12 years. But uh, at the start, uh, India would be uh, uh, investing those funds for making that satellite and also bearing the cost of launch, which like obviously India would get uh, back, entries would get back, back in a span of 12 years. So that was also something that usage of public funds for private use, that was also something that is like not in normal course of business in India. Uh, again, uh, all those reasons were there. This uh, satellite deal was cancelled. We tendered a uh, refund of the caution deposit, which was like 0.5% of the total value of the deal. That was the only deposit that we had. We refund, tendered it, they uh, refused, and then they uh, took us for arbitration. They took entries for arbitration. And uh, then the tribunal... Uh, we told that there is no actual loss that has been suffered till now because it is us who was uh, accruing expenses 
for building the satellite. It was us which would be uh, accruing the expenses for launching your satellite. Uh, so it is us who uh, who is like who have which we have already started uh, building your satellite. So this is the loss that we are suffering. You are not suffering any actual loss. Tribunal sort of agreed to that. And the tribunal, but but uh, the tribunal got more inclined to their argument that there is a future loss that we we us uh, uh, projected to suffer, uh, like future loss of revenue. That is something if the contract would have gone through, we would have uh, uh, got this much revenue, and that's the loss that we are suffering. And uh, out of all these arguments, the tribunal went ahead and the tribunal uh, gave an award in favor of Devas for $562.5 million. And uh, there was also an exorbitant interest, which was awarded at 18% uh, post-award interest till the date of payment. So, uh, and again, there, uh, there was also pre-award interest, which was like uh, not that big compared to the post-award interest. Uh, yes. Sorry to interrupt, but could you maybe um, say a few words more generally about the policy towards arbitration after that, so that when then we have time to quickly move to, to China afterwards, because we are running yeah, out of time. Yeah. So, sorry, Laura, uh, let me just sum it up in five minutes. So thereafter, so the current status is that uh, that award was, uh, after that award was passed, uh, there is enforcement action that is ongoing across the globe, uh, which is launched by Devas and its shareholders, which we are defending everywhere. And recently, we have been uh, successful in getting uh, the award set aside uh, by the competent court, the seat court, that's the Delhi High Court. And uh, they went on appeal against the set aside decision that also has been uh, rejected. So our set aside decision, the award set aside decision uh, is upheld. So that's the uh, appeal, they have exhausted their appeals, and I think that would be a final decision, but there are, of course, some writ remedies which uh, probably they may exercise, we don't know. So uh, that basically that is uh, what the divorce dispute is all about. Uh, there, was, there are also fallouts of this, uh, which are in the form of investment treaty arbitrations. Uh, wherein uh, the shareholders of Devas, the Mauritian-based shareholders, and also the German shareholders, they have launched investment treaty arbitration against the government of India for failing to protect their investment. So those are, again, uh, the awards were against government of India, and uh, I'm, I'm not the dealing person there, so I won't comment much on that. Uh, apart from that, Coming to the other question, Laura, uh, what's the trend of arbitration? Uh, in India, space disputes where, uh, wherein they are related to communication. And uh, I see that almost 85% of the revenue of the space industry comes from communication uses. The rest, 15% uh, is out of the other users of space. So uh, the communication user, is the uses of space in India are covered uh, under uh, a, a tribunal. So any dispute related to that would go on a tribunal, a specialized tribunal. Uh, it is related to telecom disputes. We call it telecom dispute settlement and appellate tribunal. So all the disputes would go there. Uh, even if there is an arbitration clause, in spite of that, uh, that would be uh, the tribunal would be having an overriding effect, and then uh, the tribunal uh, will be the appropriate forum to decide on such disputes when disputes arise in India domestically. Uh, coming to the overseas disputes, uh, like we are into, uh, we are uh, regularly entering into a lot of contracts, and uh, as a matter of practice, we have been uh, agreeing to arbitration clauses. Uh, because like we want a neutral dispute resolution process. And uh, so therefore we have been agreeing to uh, various arbitration forums and that's the normal practice when it comes to event space. So I would say that that's uh, what is the current scenario uh, here. But uh, again, so again, I'll, I'll speak more on your next question if like uh, there is any on that. Thank you. No, thank you very much for this overview and apologies for interrupting. Um, but it was very, very interesting. Um, and Peng, I don't know if you could comment on the use of arbitration in China. Would you also say that it is commonly used or not so much in the space um, sector? Yes, I guess not so much. We did have a case involving investment arbitration, uh, but it's between a Chinese investor with a uh, Ukraine. It's on a dispute on... Uh, uh, it's actually an anti-monopoly related uh, disputes. 
uh, their company in Beijing called Beijing Sky Horizon uh, Aviation Industry Investment Limited, uh, Beijing Tianjiao in Chinese. It have a contract arrangement with a Ukrainian company called Motor Sitch, right, on a, a manufacturer of aircraft engines in Ukraine. So uh, Beijing Sky Horizon, they uh, enter into a regrouping agreement with other companies. So uh, this arrangement with uh, Motor Siege uh, in Ukraine uh, have certain uh, have to go through certain anti-monopoly review, which was later vetoed by Ukraine. And uh, more than that, the Ukrainian authority actually issued a sanction list on Beijing uh, Sky Horizon uh, company and uh, its shareholders. So their shareholders believe, okay, it's uh, uh, the freeze of their shareholders and the sanction list would be uh, amounting to a provision of, uh, uh, sorry, deprivation of their investment. So their uh, case filed against Ukraine in 2021. Uh, uh, so uh, it's still pending, right? So we didn't know what the uh, result would be, uh, but uh, that's actually a case that the Chinese investor relied on investment treaty arbitration to, uh, to, to settle disputes. Uh, in addition to that, to to that, Chinese uh, Chinese government uh, position relevant and reluctant to uh, rely on or refer to a third part dispute settlement to settle space related uh, dispute. Uh, it, it's uh, I, I guess the reasons are multiple, right? National security issue, technological issue would be definitely behind this, but it's uh, a critical for our Chinese side, Chinese government side to how to conceptualize. The disputes involved. If it's categorized the disputes, disputes as a space as a security related disputes between states, so uh, it would be it would be very reluctant to uh, go to arbitration or go to international other international uh, court proceedings or um, or tribunal proceedings based on previous cases and practice. But if uh, involves only private parties, or for example, the contracts. On, for example, the manufacture of satellite launching services, uh, it, 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 arbitration is one of the options for the private party to settle the disputes, either within China or uh, in take form of international arbitration. So, uh, I if I have time, I like to uh, share points on the um, recent uh, uh, blue events or airship events. Uh, that's mainly intergovernmental disputes, right? So both sides have. Uh, Quite dramatic on this because uh, we believe it's an uh, is an incident, right? In on China side, it said okay, it's a civil airship uh, lost effective control, therefore it's due to force majeure. They, they can have to do nothing, and they notified the U.S. responding uh, counterparties. Uh, so um, uh, actually, the U.S. should an, be an obligation to rescue the civil. Uh, airship, but on uh, US side, it said, okay, the situation is on is a blue uh, SP not civilians uh, nature, therefore, it would use it for major purpose, therefore, it's a violation of US territory, therefore, to shut it down very dramatically. So, I have broader implications, unfortunately, that the State Secretary of the United States canceled its data visit to China, and uh, both parties have uh, crossed their thoughts uh, uh, in the press release, spokesperson statement later on on the uh, on the dialogue between uh, between the state uh, councillor Wang Yi and uh, uh, Secretary of State Blinken in their security uh, meetings in Europe, I believe. So both parties refer to this as the first priority matter to address too. So so uh, so you can see how the parties perceive. Uh, perceive this uh, different land, their implications on the dispute settlement. I stop here, Laura, over to you. Thank, you. Thank you very much. And I would like to let Charles comment on his experience with arbitration in commercial disputes in the space sector in, in China or in Asia in general. All right. In terms of commercial disputes, I, I'll try to be quick because uh, time is short. Uh, in my in the article which I wrote, which uh, was mentioned earlier on, I did a survey of uh, contracts which uh, Chinese private companies uh, that's putting aside the Chinese government, which Chinese private companies have made uh, internationally, and uh, these are from public uh, sources. Uh, you can be you can find them on the internet. Uh, there are reports of uh, Chinese uh, 
uh, uh, space companies are uh, uh, signing contracts with uh, counterparties in the UK, in Italy, in France, in Argentina, in Denmark, in Sudan, and 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 other countries as well. And I think you we would be able to uh, sometimes uh, one way of uh, this, of of uh, categorizing them is is sometimes the counterparties could be from technologically or capital uh, advanced countries whereas uh sometimes the the contracts may be with uh uh counterparties from entities which uh, need chinese technology and want that and which want to uh get involved in in space uh, through these contracts and uh it, this can potentially give rise to a, 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 a differences in bargaining power in terms of how these contracts are signed, and such differences in bargaining power could affect how uh, these contracts uh, end up uh, stipulating uh, their dispute resolution mechanisms. Uh, you usually expect there to be arbitration in a cross-border contract as well as domestic contracts, but uh, when talking about uh, space related contracts in China, my understanding is that the Chinese company, the Chinese side of it would usually push for a CTEC arbitration. That's an arbitration uh, uh, under the under the, the arbitral institution CTEC in, in, in Beijing. And, uh, and it depends then on whether uh, the other counterparty would be able to negotiate for for arbitration to be to be to be to be done uh uh via an, a different arbitration institution such as for example the ICC for example SIC in Singapore HKIC or or some other method and uh, when when talking about contracts and dispute resolution you will also talk about governing law sometimes these contracts may be in may, may use chinese law as the governing law and that would determine how they would be resolved sometimes they you know again depending on the party's bargaining power perhaps they may negotiate for uh, another governing law to apply so uh just quick words on that Thank you very much for this last answer and to all of you for, for the webinar today. Thank you very much for accepting the invitation and for the interesting discussion today. I will hand the microphone back over to Elena. Thank you very much.